This conference will now be recorded. Very good, folks. So good to see you all here today. Thank you for coming. We are in the autonomic nervous system. So we're looking at this uh, PowerPoint here and reviewing the information that we, I'm gonna review the introduction that I gave to you this to this chapter last class. And now I'll be going over and, and finishing up the, uh, the chapter here. And any questions that you may have, you can email me up until uh, the weekend there. And then come Monday of next week, uh, Dr. Massimo will uh, take over her classes. And so you'll be on the Tuesday, Thursday schedule still and her other classes on Monday, Wednesday. So I uh, wish you all the best regarding that. So here we go as far as the autonomic nervous system. I said to you that it's not a proper term, but you can think of it as the automatic nervous system, okay? And that the functions that are taking place are involuntary and they automatically take place in order to uh, maintain a healthy body and maintain homeostasis and maintain a stable environment within our body no matter what goes on outside. And understand that um, the sympathetic nervous system in particular of this autonomic nervous system is the one that's going to help to maintain our safety in case we're under some type of uh, uh, danger and stress. So start off with, again, the somatic nervous system. And really, the, the key issue here is that you need to recall that somatic nervous system, one synapse, the autonomic nervous system, two synapses are taking place. Again, recall that the synapse is just the junction upon which, um, so in the case of the somatic nervous system, it's the motor neuron, and it's the terminal, the axon terminal end of the axon, right? So the motor neuron interacting with the skeletal muscle. We have conscious control over this, and it's a one synapse, and actually it's a synapse where it's a chemical synapse, acetylcholine is released, and know that they don't touch, right? So let's 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 show you. Stay here for a moment, but let me go to an image here to show you as a review. Okay, so as we're looking at this image here, you see that this is representing the neuromuscular junction, the nerve muscle junction. You'll see that there's a space here. This is called the synaptic cleft. This is where these vesicles will, the synaptic vesicles will release uh, acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft here, which will in turn interact with uh, specific receptors on the motor end plate of this skeletal muscle fiber. Okay, and contraction will ensue as a result of. Uh, many different steps taking place that we reviewed in A and P1. And so, uh, yeah, it's something you shouldn't forget. You know, you should be reviewing information and such. But again, axon, axon terminal, synaptic vesicles, acetylcholine, it's a neurotransmitter. It's released in the synaptic cleft. This is a somatic motor neuron. Now, as we come to then the next slide here, we're looking at as far as autonomic neurons. Autonomic nervous system contains two, series of two neurons, okay? The preganglionic and the postganglionic, okay? And so that's that's one of the things that you really need to keep in mind right away is that smooth cardiac muscle and or glands is the effector that will be uh, as a result of this second neuron, this postganglionic neuron, okay? So you need to keep that in mind. Preganglionic, postganglionic neurons, two neurons, Somatic nervous system, one neuron, voluntary control over the skeletal muscle. Autonomic nervous system, smooth cardiac muscle, glands, those are the effectors, not the skeletal muscle of the somatic nervous system. Okay. This is important for you to just keep in mind also as far as how, uh, know that we only have one nervous system, folks. It just has multiple branches. You know, we're talking about the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, peripheral nervous system, everything else, which would include cranial nerves and spinal nerves. Okay? And so we'll see here as far as there is sensory input to the central nervous system via the peripheral nervous system, and there's motor output from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system. And whether we're going to somatic nervous system, skeletal muscle as the effector, or in the autonomic ner nervous system, cardiac smooth muscles and glands. And then you'll see here, as far as the autonomic nervous system broken down into sympathetic and parasympathetic. And we talked about this as far as sympathetic nervous system. This really 
enables you to um, uh, prepare yourself to either fight, right? Preparing the body for action. I like that term. Prepa I like that definition. Prepares the body for action. Whether you're going to run or fight, this is the situation with that fight or flight that we would describe the sympathetic nervous system. Whereas parasympathetic division, this is really understand that your body is primarily under parasympathetic control throughout most of the day. Unless you're in a stressful job and you allow for your sympathetic nervous system to get jacked up and to be stimulated. And this can be, like we said, can be very detrimental to your health, um, having your, your body, you know, adrenaline junkie, so to speak, um, and allowing yourself to uh, get really in that place of sympathetic um, stimulation where you're really not under any type of true attack, but your body is perceiving it as such, and it can really lead to um, problems down the road. All right, and also know that I didn't mention the enteric nervous system, and we'll discuss more about that uh, when we get into the digestive system, but you'll see here that that's also a part of, so sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric nervous system. These are all a part of the autonomic nervous system. You have no conscious control over this. This occurs. Can you do things to calm yourself down? Yes, you can. But really, as far as um, really overall control over what takes place within both systems and divisions there, yeah, it's, you, know, you have to do all that you can to uh, try and be calm in order not to get yourself in that sympathetic, stimulated mode continually. Um, but really, these are um, involuntary reactions that can occur to stimulate them. You'll see here the enteric nervous system for your GI tract, for your gastrointestinal tract here, complex network of neuron cell bodies and axons within the wall of the GI tract. Okay. Um, let's move on here. And you'll see that sympathetic nervous, sympathetic division, also known as the thoracolumbar division. Okay. And the reason being is because we're at T1 through L2, L3, um, this uh, area where we're going to have uh, the neurons exiting from, as far as for the uh, preganglionic and then postganglionic will be originating, the preganglionic will be initiating, originating from T1 to L2 from the uh, spine, a uh, spinal cord. And then know that um, parasympathetic would be if this sympathetic is thoracolumbar, uh, sympathetic, uh, parasympathetic will be craniosacral. We'll look at that in a moment. So again, preparing the body for action, the fight or flight situation regarding sympathetic. You'll see here it says the term um, autonomic ganglia. These are neuron cell bodies, ganglia, neuron cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. Okay. Um, along the, in the, present within the sympathetic chain ganglia. Okay. I want to show you a, there's images on my PowerPoint here, but I also want to show you, this isn't just an image to just give you a little bit more of an in situ situation. Here we go. Good. All right. So what you're looking at here, right, would be the thoracic sympathetic trunk. And so here you're seeing it's bilateral, folks, bilateral, adjacent to, so deep underneath here would be the spine, right? So you have these sympathetic chains, and these were neuron cell bodies for the preganglionic neurons for your, uh, and this is, well, actually, this is where uh, the second, the, the postganglionic neurons are going to be then exiting from. So it's going to go from the spinal cord to the sympathetic chain ganglia, from the sympathetic chain ganglia, there's a synapse here, to then one of the effectors may be. Okay, that's the thoracolumbar division. And you're just seeing thoracic, but also uh, there are lumbar too. Like I said, L1 to L2 to L3, all depending upon the vari variables with the, in uh, the human anatomy. Now you'll see here in these next couple of slides, I wanna point out to you just primarily that you'll see here preganglionic -gang -pre axons, Right, from the spinal nerves. So the spinal nerves will go to those chain ganglia. Okay. And then what's going to take place is that eventually we're going to get to after we chain ganglia have neurons, the, the, the postganglionic neuron will exit from the chain ganglia and go to, uh, in the case of sympathetic division here, um, can go to 
uh, the adrenal glands, and this would ad release adrenaline, aka noradrenaline, or we could say epinephrine, aka norepinephrine. Okay, so really it would be adrenaline, aka epinephrine, noradrenaline, aka norepinephrine. Proper, say it. And this is what's going to be released from the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands sit on the superior poles of the kidneys. So parasympathetic. We're thinking of that this is the rest and digest, the craniosacral division, region. We can say both are interchangeable, that's fine. Um, rest and digest, the SLUD, S-L-U-D-D, I mentioned this last time. Salivation, lacrimation, urination, digestion, and defecation. These are all functions of reparative functions and functions that take place as we're at rest. Right? Um, as we're under stress and, and doing things and very busy and active, we're not, the body is really not as much focused on doing these functions, only when we're at rest. Is So when you're uh, sitting in classroom, right, and uh, you're, you're just sitting and you're in, either in the classroom or you're here in front of your computers um, and you're doing your schoolwork, yeah, you seem to, oh man, why am I having to use the restroom on a more frequent basis, you, you know, going to avoid, urinate and such, um, in comparison to when I'm Busy and active, and I don't seem to notice it as much. Yeah, that's why, because of parasympathetic control and stimulus. And so what we're looking at here would be uh, cranial nerves number three, seven, and we'll have this in a moment, three, seven, uh, nine, and 10 would be the cranial portion, and then the sacral portion would be S2 to S4. Okay. Let's put that there. I believe that you'll have that there also, but just so that you can see that there. Cranial nerves, three, seven, nine, and 10, and the vagus nerve, as well as, oh, as well as S2 through S4. There we go, very good, okay. all right. And so what's going to take place in that, um, you'll see here, this is this is a good image and, and I want you to keep it in mind, and I did mention this to you last time, but realizing that as far as preganglionic, postganglionic, again, remember somatic uh, neurons, it's just a matter of that in the somatic nervous system, it's the uh, one synapse system, all right? One synapse, right at the neuromuscular junction. Here, for the autonomic nervous system, whether it's sympathetic, remember sympathetic would be what? T1, so thoracolumbar, T1 to L2, L3, okay? Remember, it's the sympathetic chain ganglia that are bilateral, right, both sides adjacent to uh, the spinal cord. So, you know, it's a little anterior, but you can see it's adjacent to uh, on both sides of the spinal cord. So we have this preganglionic neuron, right? Here's the neuron cell body, and then it's going to what? Create a synapse right in the sympathetic chain ganglia. So it's a short preganglionic neuron, a long postganglionic neuron, because this axon here is going to go to the target organ, okay? Um, different in the case of the parasympathetic, because it's going to go from a long preganglionic neuron and then short to the actual target organ itself. So it's just opposite. See how they're both opposite as far as uh, they're both two synapses, but just one has a, a longer, long preganglionic, one has a short preganglionic, you need to know the difference between the two. Just remember that just as far as that's concerned, okay? We're gonna talk about what's released at these junctions here, okay? Where the synapse occurs. So here's a synapse and here will be a synapse. Synapse, synapse, right? Two synapses, both systems. Now in the case of the inter Enteric nervous system, like I said, we'll discuss this in more detail when we're looking at and seeing the anatomy of uh, the digestive system. Um, but you'll see here that there are these nerve plexuses within the wall of the digestive tract and will can act really, um, really separate from what's going on with the nervous system, that they can actually be confined to. You'll see here the enteric neurons are confined to the enteric plexi, which are adjacent to the uh, digestive tract and they will in turn can really kind of work 
separate from what's going on as far as our brain giving information direct, the enteric nervous system itself, right, locally in the digestive system can make changes and such and adjustments regarding control of digestion. Here we go. And, and here we go with this as far as, so parasympathetic division, right? The craniosacral division, cranial nerves three, seven, nine, and 10, okay? So you'll see here as far as oculomotor, facial, glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve. Now, out of them all, as far as importance would be concerned, it's this vagal nerve um, issue here that really is important as far as stimulation going to all of the organs within the uh, abdominal pelvic region, the thoracic region, um, very important, heart and lungs, esophagus. Folks, you can have a catastrophic, you can experience a catastrophic injury and have damage to the spinal cord and still have control over and not need to be on a respirator because the vagus nerve is still intact and sending nerve flow to uh, the different organs of the uh, thorac thorax and uh, abdominal pelvic region. It's pretty remarkable, actually. So you'll see here as far as the role of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, again, just, just a rules at state of acute stress, rules at a state of rest regarding the parasympathetic and acute stress and sympathetic. Now this slide, you might wanna break this slide down into in, like take this information and write it out on paper so that it's not as compact. When I was producing this, I, I do apologize. I was, I, I should have, um, separated this a little bit more and made a couple of slides regarding it but i just felt it was important to get it all in one spot and then if you want to on your own separate it that's fine let me explain to you something here that goes on so acetylcholine is released via cholinergic neurons okay so cholinergic neurons you see here cholinergic neurons all preganglionic neurons in the sympathetic and parasympathetic um, regions here, so look over here, system, these would be cholinergic because acetylcholine is going to be released right here. Acetylcholine, that's the neurotransmitter, that's going to be released there. So hence, we would say that they are cholinergic, okay? So the preganglionic neurons, cholinergic, okay? Now, um, as far as the adrenergic neurons, well, adrenergic, right? Most of the sympathetic postganglionic neurons are going to be adrenergic because that's where we're going to have release of epinephrine, norepinephrine, aka also known as adrenaline, noradrenaline. Okay, so that's the different. That's the in understanding these terms, cholinergic and adrenergic. That's what you need to think of, right? Acetylcholine, so cholinergic, adrenergic. You think um, adrenaline, noradrenaline, but the other term would be epinephrine, norepinephrine, right? Let's see here. And so let's go to then receptors. So if we have specific receptors throughout the body for whatever it may be, hormones, these neurotransmitters, whatever it may be, right? These receptors then would have to, so if they bind to acetylcholine, right? If these receptors bind to acetylcholine, it would be what? Choline, so it'd be cholinergic. Now, in cholinergic receptors, we have nicotinic and we have muscarinic. Now, nicotinic and muscarinic, just know that nicotinic is just like what you think it is, nicotine. And so we have found that through studies and through research that these certain receptors, not only will they bind to acetylcholine, but they'll also bind to nicotine. And know that there are other receptors for specific for acetylcholine that will bind to muscarin, which is a, um, a product of um, fungi, okay, fungus, mushroom, okay? So I know it's kind of a little bit like, really? But this is just how, how it is as far as the determination of these, how we would label these certain cholinergic receptors. Adrenergic receptors would do what? Well, they're gonna receive what? They're gonna be receptors for adrenaline. So noradrenaline, Adrenaline, aka norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay. 
So don't let these terms get you too freaked out, but I'm just trying to explain it to you a little bit there. And, and you know, write it out. You can write it out a little bit. That'll help you to get it. And know that regarding um, for adrenergic receptors, these adrenergic receptors, right, two different types, alpha and beta receptors, okay? And these are broken down even further into alpha-1 and beta-1 and alpha-2 and beta-2, okay? So the uh, alpha-1 and beta-2 usually have opposite effects than the alpha-2 and beta-2. And if you've ever heard of um, beta blockers, right, for uh, blood pressure medication, so beta blockers would be that we would be actually, the medication would be blocking these beta receptors. Okay. So on the heart in particular, uh, the beta receptors, if we block them, then the heart's not going to respond to the adrenaline, right? The norepinephrine and the epinephrine is a neurotransmitter, which would act as a stimulatory. But if we block those stimulatory re receptors, so we're not allowing for uh, continual stimulation to take place of the, the heart to increase heart rate, blood pressure and such, this way it will lower the blood pressure. Does that make sense? It, sh it should. Now, you also should have an idea regarding the effects. So like I said to you that when we when we think of the basic foundational in, information regarding, well, sympathetic is stimulatory, parasympathetic, yeah, it's also stimulatory, but in different areas like the digestive system and not the other systems of the body, okay? So it's more for, again, calm, peace, rest, sympathetic, preparing the body for action, okay? And so you'll see here that you should now, this is just giving you a few part here. Um, online, if I can show you that, if you just look up, here we're seeing that you can pull up Many different images, and I would suggest you do this, right? I, there's just one in your your in your PowerPoint there, but you can look up all of these to help you. <coughs> Excuse me. Regarding the effects of the parasympathetic in comparison to the sympathetic, my suggestion: memorize what takes place in the sympathetic as far as these different. Um, effects that sympathetic stimulation can have on the body, and then you'll know what's taking place as far as parasympathetic as a result of it's not going to be the same as the sympathetic, okay? No sense in memorizing them both. Memorize one as far as stimulatory and then sympathetic, and then you'll be able to figure out what the parasympathetic response would be. And here, what you're seeing next, would be just a few images and showing you as far as the, on the left, on your reading left, would be sympathetic and you're looking at a demonstration of the uh, sympathetic chain ganglia, right? And so again, T1 to L2, L3, right? T1 to L2 for the test, that's what you should put, but I'm just giving you that range there. And know that cranial sacral for the parasympathetic division as far as three, seven, nine, and 10. And then you have here, the uh, sympathetic, uh, I mean, uh, parasympathetic also sacral region S2 through S4, okay? And you see the areas of the body that are being uh, innervated by these uh, specific systems. And let's see here, as far as autonomic reflexes control most of the activity of the visceral organs, glands, and blood vessels, okay? And, and know that it's the hypothalamus is the master controller. And we will be, when we're studying the endocrine system, when we're coming up to the endocrine system, you're gonna see that, uh, we'll say that the pituitary gland is the master gland. But know that the hypothalamus, this is the master controller of the master gland and of the autonomic nervous system. It's quite remarkable, folks, really, how that hypothalamus, it's not a very large area of the brain, anterior and inferior to in that uh, uh, third ventricle, uh, yet the importance of the hypothalamus and the nuclei, the groups of neuron cell bodies present within um, that hypothalamic region and the control that it exerts, it's, uh, it's quite amazing, okay? And here you're seeing also regarding the enteric nervous system being mentioned and the local reflexes that will uh, take place as a result of that enteric nervous system controlling what's taking place as far as digestive functions are concerned. 
And you'll see here as far as a sympathetic reflex, right? Stimulatory to the heart, increasing heart rate, parasympathetic reflex results in a decrease in heart rate. So you see how the opposites as far as this autonomic reflex is concerned. And again, too, via the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. And here you're seeing as far as whatever type of stimulation we have going on regarding uh, dilation and constriction. Uh, know that dilation really is a matter of that we want to, if you're under sympathetic stimulation, right, and um, we want to then have as much light entering into the uh, retina as possible so that we have the best ability to see what's going on around us uh, for survival mechanism. Whereas pupillary constrict constriction, we're thinking of parasympathetic uh, influence. And know that you'll see here as far as the limbic system, right, uh, as well as the cerebral hemispheres involved in uh, working with um, the autonomic nervous system and functions as well as, you know, via the uh, hypothalamus. Uh, when we're thinking of, um, again, to really the hypothalamus, think of it as the autonomic nervous system control center. And again, this will work in conjunction with um, many parts of the body and really causing a great, great deal of influence through uh, the pituitary hormones that are going to be released throughout the body. Uh, brainstem, spinal cord also, uh, reflex centers, and you can see here as far as their associated areas of what they would control. And you'll see here as far as biofeedback, and this is what I mentioned to you earlier about, yes, you know what, There's, it's really um, tough to be able to, you know, really, <laughs> your body is going to do what it's going to do automatically with the autonomic nervous system, but can you do things in order to enhance the relaxation and bring about more of a return back to, you know, people that are having anxiety, people that are having high blood pressure and other issues can use biofeedback in order to bring about more of a calm. Folks, you can actually, if you close your eyes and you belly breathe, you allow your abdomen to, um, abdominal pelvic area there to expand as you breathe and you do it nice and slow, what you'll be doing is you'll be stimulating uh, cranial nerve number 10, right, via the, um, the diaphragm and you'll stretch that nerve and it'll cause, bring about more of a parasympathetic effect and it'll calm you down. Just something to give you a little bit of insight there and try that sometime. Place your hands on your belly and just, you know, breathe in and out, allowing for your belly to expand as you breathe. And you'll see that after you do that 10 times, it should really help to calm you a bit. And if you're experiencing some type of anxiety or issue where you're stressed out, that could be a help. 